Welcome to Think on KERA. I'm Chris Boyd. Congress is back in session Monday following the Easter recess and with hearings pending for Attorney General Alberto Gonzalez and a war spending bill to pass, lawmakers will need to hit the ground running as they return to the Capitol. One representative finishing up a very busy, very busy visit home is Eddie Bernice Johnson, who serves the 30th Congressional District of Texas. We're very glad she was able to make the time to join us today. Congresswoman, welcome to Think. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. You did not support going to uh, war in Iraq in the first place. I did not. Now that we're there and having to make decisions about how and when to withdraw, what factors are you considering? Well, before we reach a, a date, I'd like to see um, benchmarks. We need to determine how many of the uh, Iraqis we need to train for their own security. Uh, it has not been good because the uprisings. Uh, sometimes I think it's because uh, they got somebody fighting for them. They want to know why they should fight for themselves. But I, uh, I do think we should put that on their minds and start to redeploy our troops. After some hesitation, uh, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, has said she will sit down with the President next Wednesday and talk about problems resolving the spending bill. Which side do you think is more likely to budge? <laughs> That's going to be hard to tell. Nancy is very small in stature, and most people think that they can kind of push her around, but they can't. <laughs> she, um, she will hold her ground. Uh, I'm hoping that it would be some type of agreement, but, uh, you know, just boundless spending in Iraq has to come to an end. Uh, we are spending $5 billion a week. That is a lot of money, and it's in cash money. Um, no accountability. Uh, it's suitcases of cash, and I think it's really time for us to be more accountable to the people. Folks on the other side of the aisle say that money is protecting the troops that we have there. Well, the troops have not realized a, uh, probably 75 percent of the money. Uh, it's not the troops. The troops are still looking for armor. Uh, they still need uh, proper protection that many families are sending. Uh, if we had the idea of more accountability, we would not be as difficult. But our troops don't get the care no matter how much money we put there. You were a psychiatric nurse at the VA yes. in the beginning of your career. What do you worry about in terms of the mental health care that our troops are getting when they return to this country? Well, I have a, a very big concern about that. This is a different kind of war. It's a questionable war. Uh, it's very stressful. Uh, the first trip I made to Iraq, they were sleeping on the ground wherever they found a spot they could go to sleep. Uh, that's better now. but. It is not a war where there's a line of people on the other side. You never know where they are. Uh, it might be someone you've had a nice conversation with 10 minutes ago. Uh, almost anywhere they move around, even now in the, in the uh, green zone. Used to be in the green zone, uh, you were always pretty safe. But now that is not the case. Uh, going about your work and not being able to even predict when or where a bullet might strike your head is pretty traumatic. And they're having to stay longer and go back. And, uh, you know, I was a nurse at the VA when many of the Vietnam uh, veterans came. And they were very traumatized. And this is very much like Vietnam, I think in some ways worse. Um, so I did put uh, an amendment uh, in the latest bill, uh, which I co-sponsored, to say that the troops should be evaluated by well-trained staff. We um, have always attempted to save money, but when you start to get less than qualified people to do evaluations, then you're not doing anybody a favor. Uh, if they get diagnosed early as a post-traumatic stress syndrome or whatever, they can get attention earlier. Uh, but if it, you know, we've had veterans uh, come to us, young people without legs or whatever, and plead for us to help them to get another wheelchair or 
just very basic things. You see the wheelchairs are in, they're all taped up and put, trying to keep them together. That should never happen. Anytime we have young people that are willing to voluntarily go into the military and willing to sacrifice their lives, as they say, uh, at our benefit or for us, we ought to have enough decency to give them the kind of treatment rehabilitation that they had need when they come back. The subcommittee you chair deals with water resources and the environment. What do you make of the study released this week that says Texas could enter a permanent drought state in 15 years due to global warming? Well, you know, I don't, our president just acknowledged uh, global warming about a month ago. Uh, since he's been in office, we've not been able to pass a bill uh, in water resources and development. Um, I'm hoping this year that we can pass one because the longer we wait, the worse the situations are. We got to do the work and it becomes more costly. Uh, in Dallas, we are sweating out every rain, uh, hoping it won't flood downtown, but, and, and some of the homes as well. Uh, I have looked out for the money for that correction. If we could ever get it signed into law. Uh, water plan is very important, but Texas did start some time ago. Uh, and planning for water supply. But our population just keeps growing, and the longer it grows, uh, the more we will need water supply. Uh, our, every, every bit of our infrastructure is pretty old and needs replacing, from the purification to um, trying to recycle water. We simply cannot make the best use until we have the best technology. Are you confident the water supply is secure from tampering or terrorism? We are creating the terrorist by being in Iraq. Uh, when we end this war or get out of it, I don't think we have to fear any terrorism. Uh, we probably are more physically safe, uh, but dynamically we are not any safer because we are still in the war. At the end of this month, Fannie Mae is shutting down its charitable foundation amid some accusations that the foundation did some lobbying that may have been improper on behalf of the for-profit side of the corporation. Um, was it your experience ever that they crossed the line and there, and there was some lobbying taking place on one side that shouldn't have? I never experienced it. I never saw it, and I was never suspicious of it. Um, Fannie Mae uh, backed up a lot of home ownership of people that never would have had the opportunity without Fannie Mae. Uh, <clears throat> many of us feel that this is sort of a pick at Fannie Mae. They've had a lobbyist. I have visited with the lobby lobbyist many times. And I don't remember him ever asking me anything, just coming by to speak and make an acquaintance. He's been very supportive of programs, uh, when we, when the Congressional Black Caucus started the home ownership program right after North Carolina floods, uh, they stepped in to be of assistance. I can remember pleading with financial institutions right here in Dallas to give us help for re, uh, rehabilitation of homes in the southern sector. Um, all of a sudden, they were all interested because that was Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to help back it up. And uh, we've gotten in trouble because many of those loans were not wise. They were subprime. Uh, the people didn't know many times what they were getting into. And now we're suffering bankruptcies. But that was not the fault of Fannie Mae nor Freddie Mac. It's the financial institutions where the people truly do not understand. I had classes, Urban League had classes to try to make sure people could uh, get around the subprime loans. But Dallas, Texas, has the worst subprime loan environment in the country. El Paso and Dallas are the two places that have it. And, I, and that's one of the reasons we can point to uh, as a reason for the bankruptcies. There's been some criticism um, in 2004 when you were chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. You accepted the help of some people from Fannie Mae's foundation uh, to draft a letter in support of the then CEO of uh, Fannie Mae. Was that, did you see that as a, as a lobbying effort or simply as, as um, some assistance that you received from the foundation? Well, uh, what happened, uh, you thank people 
when they do things for you. Our foundation is nonprofit. Uh, it is not the same as the Congressional Black Caucus. Most of the board members are not members of the caucus. I'm talking about the Fannie Mae Foundation. Oh, the Fannie Mae Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Fannie Mae Foundation had uh, assisted us in various uh, ceremonies. When I took my oath, uh, they sponsored a reception, and they routinely had done this over the years. They're still doing it. And, uh, and when that does happen, yes, you thank them. And I happen to know Franklin Raines uh, when he was there, and I had met uh, Mr. Hunt as well. Uh, Franklin Raines I met when, when our Governor Ann Richards hired him to come help us get out of that big deficit back in the 80s. And he came and helped us get out of that. He was younger then. I didn't even realize the same person for a while. Uh, but we were talking one day, and uh, I was uh, talking about how I've enjoyed meeting him, and he said, this is not where we met. And he, he had less hair now. But um, he has a brilliant mind and had been, I think, a, a great leader. Um, and I'll never believe that he did anything wrong. A year out from the primary elections, you have already come out in support um, and provided an endorsement for John Edwards' campaign for the Democratic I did it nomination. a year ago, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Seems I like things could change between now and then. Well, it might be. Uh, you know, in my world, uh, changes happen all the time. Uh, but he has been very responsive. I supported him the first time around. Didn't know him that well then, but what I do remember about him is that he stood side by side with us in North Carolina to try to get the rehabilitation of those areas where slaves had come in. Uh, nobody was paying it any attention. There were houses underwater. Um, it was not as many as New Orleans, but it was a really bad situation, and he was always there. So I knew him quite well, and I lobbied for him to become the vice presidential candidate. I'm really not ashamed of that because I thought he would be good for this country. I still think he would. We have a lot of candidates, though, that would be good for this country. But when I commit, all I have is my word. I am loyal until something else comes along. All the punditry right now would focus on the fact that you, as a Democrat, an African American, and a woman, people would assume that you would that the toss-up would be between Barack Obama and Hillary Rodham Clinton. Do you think that's an oversimplification of not just you as an individual, but of uh, the potential of women and African Americans to vote a certain way? Well, if it, I had talked with both of them, I had no idea they were going to be running. But in a sense, I'm happy to be committed. I don't have to make that decision right away. Uh, I work well with both of them. I have great respect for both of them. Um, and it would have been difficult for me to make a choice between the two. But since I've made a choice, it gives me a little rolling room until some other decision is made. How different has your job been in the last 100 days now that the Democrats are controlling the House of Representatives from, from the years when the GOP was in power? Very difficult because now you've got the responsibility of pulling things together. You've got the responsibility of making sure that you have all the research done, the reading, the briefing of, of the issues that you're trying to lead on. Uh, before, we were just, uh, you, you wanted to do some leadership, but for the most part, you were attempting to be alert as to what they're doing to you, so, so to speak. So uh, it, it's a big difference. And with the pressures uh, coming from outside, the pundits, whatever, uh, we want to do the right thing for the country. And you, it, it does not come easily. You have to really understand what you're doing and the implications of it, what reactions might be. And I don't mean reactions to people. I'm thinking about reactions of institutions where if you go to correct one portion, then it gets worse somewhere else. So you've got to really get all that background before you make a decision, or at least be aware of it so that when a decision is made, uh, you have an alternative if it doesn't seem to work. So it's a lot of responsibility. Have the Democrats achieved less in this period of time than you would have hoped by now? No, 
I, I think we've done we've done better than any Congress I've been in in getting major pieces of legislation passed at this time. It's it's not out of the Senate, but it certainly is out of the House, and we have major pieces waiting to be uh, scheduled for floor debate. Well, I guess part of the issue is making sure that the two sides match up, that the House and the Senate bills can actually uh, come yeah. to resolution. Yeah, the conference committees are very important. And and, and what's the holdup there? Do you think do you think things will start to move now after the recess is over? I hope so. We've been watching the uh, water bill, which is the Water Resource and Development Bill, uh, which is very important to this area. And they have passed a bill out of committee. And we passed a bill out of committee, which will be set for debate uh, probably next week or the week after. And in that case, we will be in conference early. You've just come out of a recess, or you're, you're going back to uh, to session uh, on Monday, and uh, you know many people assume that it's been a vacation the whole time. And I know this, <laughs> there's a lot of work in the district. Talk about what you do when you're in recess, and, and how you actually recharge when you do have a few minutes. Well, it's very busy when we're in the district, and people say, "Oh, I haven't seen you," and you just think, you know, <laughs> I haven't been hiding. I have been working. Uh, but there are a lot of speaking engagements, there are a lot of um, factories to visit, uh, there are a lot of appointments where people don't come to Washington and they want to explain it directly to you. So there is really not a minute. I get about 30 minutes for lunch. So my personal things have to be done late at night. Um, but you know, I ask the people to vote for me and sometimes I think of myself as, what am I doing to myself when I do this? But it is very busy, and I don't believe there is any member of Congress who does not utilize these so-called district work periods to really work, to be in touch with the people, uh, to hear their voices. Um, I met with a group uh, Wednesday that has great problems with the um, dart rail line design around Love Field. I had not heard that before. Uh, and I did tell them that I would write. I said, but I, you know, I can't change it. I never want to. I have try to make sure they get the money because it's a great system. So unless you're in touch with the people, you never really know where the people are on issues. Representative Eddie Bernice Johnson serves the 30th Congressional District of Texas. Congresswoman, thank you so much for making time for us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate it. Just ahead on Think, the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History reveals how its new building will look and work. First, KERA's Deep in the Arts calendar.